I'm at Black Star Co-op in Austin again with brewmaster Jeff Young tasting a local favorite, the Live Oak Hefeweizen. I'm gonna get me a Live Oak Hefe, please. A beer with a beautiful color of almost mystical quality. It's a vibrant, creamy yellow that seemingly glows in the sunlight, yet you can't quite see through it. If you're like me, you'll find yourself mesmerized by it, staring at it. If you don't bust out your smartphone and take some beer porn shots of this bad boy, your Instagram followers may never forgive you. Hell, Sherwin-Williams and Benjamin Moore should make a paint color called Live Oak Heffy. But the wow factor doesn't stop at the color. The nose and the taste of this Hefeweizen bring the cloves and droves. It's like someone transported your face to Bavaria. You're gonna want some meat. Germans love meat. And this is no lawnmower beer. It's got punch with a 5.2% ABV. Hi, I'm Mike Langford, and this is Locapore, the show about locally brewed beer. So a couple of things about this beer, it's really special to me, frankly, the, the Live Oak Heffy. Now, I know it's not one you brew, but I think you'll be able to talk to some of the, the coolest oh, yeah. fact that this is a beer that I had never seen before because Texas beers aren't imported into Massachusetts where I'm from. You cannot get Texas beers in Boston. Sure. It was great, delicious, very befitting, the temperature and heat. But there's also one really interesting thing about it. Number one, the color is absolutely spectacular. It holds the lack of clarity, if you will, the cloudiness. The entire time you drink it, it doesn't settle. But also, and I can't wait to get it, it smells of and tastes of clove. Mm -hmm. And I am immediately transported back to like being nine years old when my mother, uh, she used to bake a ham. And, and she would put cloves all on the ham. The house would just smell phenomenal, right? Uh -oh. And so it's like a time machine beer almost. Like it's like this <laughs> relaxing time machine beer. Uh -huh. So that's what I get. So I'm really uh -huh. excited to be covering this. And I know it's not yours, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about it. Uh -huh. So as a brewmaster, as a guy who just, and a chemist, the guy who just knows stuff, like what the heck is the difference between a wheat beer, a blonde, or a Hefeweizen? Yeah, these are really interesting beers. So a Hefeweizen is, is kind of a traditional style from Germany, yeah. Hefe meaning uh, yeast and Weizen meaning okay. wheat. So there, there's the yeast aspect and then there's the wheat uh, aspect. I think the bigger contributor to some of these wheat beers and what people think of wheat beers is actually the yeast and the fermentation flavors that come along with that specific kind of yeast. Okay. So the haziness is coming from the yeast oh, okay. solution. So you're, you're drinking yeast. So the and, yeast and is actually still kind of just like just suspended? It's in, in suspension. Yeah, yeah okay. it's in suspension. In addition to that, not only are we tasting the yeast, but the yeast byproducts yeah. during fermentation are very special with this kind of yeast. Okay. And they will produce uh, phenolic compounds. All right. And some of the subcategories and descriptors of phenolic compounds would be clove. Okay. Smokiness, so band-aid, so clove. It is a product of the, the brewing and, the, and, the, and the, yeah, the fermentation, yeah. right? Yeah, and that's where a lot of actually beer flavor comes from fermentation. Yeah. You know, we add great malts and, and great hops and they come through, uh, but a lot of the compounds, the majority of just these random compounds are all created during fermentation okay. and all combined uh, make up some very, you know, distinguishing kind of flavors with the Hefeweizen during fermentation uh, produces two uh, categories of flavors very largely, and that's the phenolics, which yep. you're getting some of that clove, and then uh, higher alcohols slash esters, uh, where you're getting some of that banana character. Okay, so it's banana is a so big one. Does it depend upon the the strain of yeast you choose, or the length of brewing, the time you let it uh, ferment, or whatever that that creates? heavier banana versus clove, because this is actually the first one that I've ever experienced, and maybe just because I haven't experienced a lot of this style, that I really picked the clove up. Yeah. I just like, uh, it was just, it hit me heavy. Like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is, yeah, as I was yeah, told, yeah. It was almost like a transformative beer experience, frankly, when I had this the first yeah. time. Yeah, the clove is, is a little more specifically to the yeast because you can have other kinds of beers, use another kind of yeast and still get some banana character. So this beer kind of combines those two uh, in different ways. And that's part of kind of controlling the fermentation, making sure your yeast are able to produce those compounds, not overproduce them, I think yeah. is a really important thing in, in these kind of beers. That's interesting. Yeah. That's fascinating to me. Yeah, up in Boston, a lot of the beers that I would buy out, I could also pick up in the store. And I found out after I moved here that, oh, it's there's some sort of weird law. What do you know about how that's that's moving in the direction of me being able to get my whatever beer at home? 
for us here in Texas, there's a very strict line in between what we call the three tiers, which is a manufacturer, just somebody that just solely makes beer, yep. a distributor, somebody that takes that beer and, and sells it to the next tier, which is the retail, which Black Star is considered a retail. Okay. Sure, we produce beer, but we produce it kind of on, on a smaller scale. We're not making it to go across the country. Now, um, along that line, can I get your beer and bring it home, like in a growler or yes. something like that? Oh, so they allow you to do that, which is awesome. Okay. As long as you purchase it here, you're allowed to take it with you and, and do whatever you want with it. Uh, but those laws, we are right smack dab in the middle of those laws changing to where there is a little more leeway to what we can do. As a retailer, we're going to be able to sell to distributors who will then be able to sell to other distributors. So we can't sell to another distributor directly, but this will allow us to have our brand and our products out in the market, essentially anywhere in the world. So is, is that going to be possible someday in the relatively near future? Someday, hopefully this year, yeah. Oh, really? If, if, That's soon, yeah. okay. By the end of 2013, we could be on shelves uh, on places, and that is really exciting. So here's the issue. It's really exciting to be able to reach people from different places, but as you start expanding, and as you start getting further and further away from your, your home, from the brew pub, yeah. from the people, you start losing things. Yeah. We are the craft beer industry because we are the minority, because we care about these kind of things. Right. And if we were to become the majority, almost by necessity, we would lose those factors of intimacy. We wouldn't lose necessarily quality, but we might have to take quality in a different way that would sure. maybe start stripping some of those characteristics. I love the fact that I come in here and I know the staff that's brewing, serving, mm -hmm. experiencing this day in and day out. You feel a connectedness to it and an experience that you just don't get with when you just you know, buy a six pack of whatever beer that. Yeah. We're talking about this a lot here in Texas is, yeah. is, is a lot of craft breweries from other states coming into Texas yeah. and Texas breweries, uh, craft breweries going into other states. I just don't feel comfortable with it. If we're going to continue to be a craft industry, you can't get that big. We can't eventually we turn can't into craft, the Walmart right? of, of craft beer. I, I really feel like it's best appreciated locally, freshly. There's a lot of great beers out there. I want to come to them. I want to go to them. The sense of, of craftness cannot be uh, mass produced yeah. and that's what happens when you have to go across the country is you have to raise your quality control to a level that starts stripping not only some of, of the flavors about but some of the creativity sure. that was put into it too. Yeah. I agree. Like you have to be a little more general. You have to be more approachable by the average person in, in uh, New Jersey versus you know San Francisco or something. So I don't think it's a good thing being so national if we're trying to be craft beer. I want to support a community, whether I'm visiting that community or I live in that community. I want to make sure that the money I spend there, is, as much of it as possible, stays there, right? Benefits the people who are... So when I look at a craft beer, it's like, well, you brewed this beer here. The people who worked on this beer are here. The people who own this building are here in Austin. So, you know, a much larger percentage of the economic benefits, the proceeds of this endeavor stay in my community and therefore support the schools, support the roads and all that type of stuff. So that's better for me yes. as a citizen to consume there. Do we really need to ship it across the country just to have one different IPA that uses one different hop? Versus somebody down the road that makes a beautiful beer yeah. that, that's affordable, that I know the guy, that we hang out and, right. and part of the community. So I think that is what we need to focus on as, as a craft industry is embracing the things that work, that we understand, that are well done, and forgetting about the hype, forgetting about the brands and the labels, sure. and just get back to the beer itself. 100%. Great. Yeah. All right, so we're at the end. We are at um, the end. Quick question. Uh huh. So I've already told you like my experience with this beer. So I just like I said, I get tons of cloves, tons of summer hot. Just that's the experience I'm getting from this beer. Mm -hmm. This being a clove smell associated with ham and so forth. I'm thinking like salty, but meaty too. So not just chips, right? Okay. Like I'm gonna need some sort. So stuffed avocado. 
Have you oh, had the deep fried stuffed avocado? Yeah. It goes really delicious. That would go well. Yeah, so a little I just think barbecue, Texas barbecue ah, all right, would yeah. just go great with this. And I, I think these are just like natural emergences of, of uh, great beer that works well in this environment. Okay. Uh, the food, like the, the barbecue that works well in this yeah. environment. And if they both work well in this environment, it just happened to work well together too. A marriage made in heaven. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers to you.